Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Derek Osborne and I'd like to welcome you to the session on urban logistics as the second part of our sustainability leadership imperative. What you may say is the sustainability leadership imperative. Well, it was launched in May this year as a joint initiative between PIP, Postal Innovation Platform, and myself, What Next For You, and our benchmarking uh, workshop approach to share experience and expertise. So the post and parcel sector as a whole has a huge footprint in every aspect of life, especially business, trade, logistics, consumers and governments, which means it has a, a big impact uh, potentially in lots of ways. And we want to bring together as part of this imperative, we want to bring together the, the sustainability initiatives across the whole parcel, postal and logistics sector to establish some kind of sector leadership with a stronger, wider influence on the sustainability agenda for the world, which we feel we can have. And we also want to stimulate strategic leadership initiatives, engagement for the, these initiatives and championing action programs that make a difference. And finally, we want to facilitate the deployment of sustainability business models, solutions and technologies that work. And so this is part of uh, our initiative and our events that we're organizing. And today, we will be talking about urban logistics and new sustainable business models for the last mile. So I'll hand over to Bernard now. I think you're on mute. Can't, can't hear you, Bernard. That's a good point. You know, I'm I'm muting everybody, and I'm forgetting to unmute myself. So isn't that isn't that intelligent? <laughs> but thank you very much for the message. So I think I'll restart. Okay, as you all know, what I was saying is, the flow of uh, goods in larger areas has always been a huge challenge. That was always the real challenge that the post and other delivery companies were were facing. And over the past two decades, uh, with the boom in e-commerce, uh, with changing uh, customer demands, uh, the pressure has increased. The pressure to implement, on the one hand side, customer-centric solutions, and on the other hand side, uh, sustainable strategies. Uh, to respond to this, to this uh, tremendous push for change, it simply is not enough to just adapt the existing infrastructure, but rather to develop uh, new business models. and Maybe with a holistic approach uh, and uh, new business models, it will be possible to make the last mile greener, make it more customer uh, centric, increase the convenience for customers, but at the same time, uh, maybe enable cost cuttings and uh, create new revenue, revenue streams. So this and more questions we are going to discuss today with our speakers. We have here André Farrand, uh, Global Managing Director, Postal, Parcel and Last Mile at Accenture. Martin Schneider, Head of Operations Zurich, Swiss Post. Ellen Berry, Managing Director of Delivering London. Uh, before we start, just uh, two very quick uh, organizational elements. First of all, please keep your mics on mute as I just did when I started to speak. So if you speak, just unmute, please. Uh, and the other one, you can ask questions, of course, and you are even um, invited to do so. Um, you have a chat box, uh, whether you join via the WebEx platform, you have a chat box, uh, whether you join uh, by uh, by YouTube live stream. In both cases, we'll have a look uh, at uh, the chat boxes, pick up questions that you have from there. If you want to say something as well and join the discussion, we have a discussion at the end. You can do so as well, of course. Um, I would now like to give the floor to our speakers and to our first speaker here in, the different, uh, in particular. Andre, you are ready? Yes, I am. Okay, that is perfect. So please take the floor. All right. Here. Okay, can you see uh, my presentation? Yes, we can see it. All right, perfect. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm here to uh, share with some research that Accenture did, um, and uh, which is entitled uh, The Sustainable Last Mile, uh, Faster, Cheaper, Greener. Uh, what I'll show you is our research um, has uh, shown that uh, by uh, going towards micro fulfillment centers, 
and what is considered to be or called local fulfillment, uh, broadly speaking, uh, does achieve faster, cheaper, greener results on, on the last mile. Um, so what did we do uh, about the this is any companies very close to consumer and and uh, a lot of best enter us uh, dark store or been and um stores that um the um department stores uh, or hypermarkets like Walmart Target and others like that. So what we decided to do is say, look, let's take a look at this. Let's assume that uh, what if we said 50% of all uh, future um, e-commerce deliveries will be done via local fulfillment or micro fulfillment centers. And what would be the outcome in terms of uh, traffic, in terms of um, also uh, congestion and, and emissions or carbon footprint? So we looked at that uh, and we studied this over a five year period. We looked at three cities. We looked at London, Chicago, and uh, Sydney. Now you might be wondering why these three cities? Well, uh, two reasons. One is that they are very representative. We wanted to focus on um, urban areas. Uh, large cities, large global cities, and also where we had data, because uh, not all cities have the same amount of data. So all we did was essentially uh, test this out. Now, uh, what happened also, um, as you know, we, we didn't really plan this, was COVID happened, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, by necessity, we saw stores, especially around October, November, uh, when we started hitting, let's call it a double peak, uh, the COVID peak plus Christmas and, uh, and that demand, where we started seeing a lot of stores doing actually what we were uh, I guess, uh, testing out in this research, which was uh, local fulfillment um, for a number of reasons, uh, most likely uh, because uh, many of the um, suppliers or, or delivery companies just didn't have capacity and, and kind of stopped the uh, um, uh, pickups. Uh, but in any case, what I want to do is just show you uh, what this research uh, shows and uh, what are some of the key conclusions. Um, so let's see here. Um, what I want to share with you is uh, a definition of what is local fulfillment and, and how it differs from what how fulfillment is done today. Uh, the best way I can describe this is local fulfillment is fulfillment done by uh, fulfillment centers that are located much closer to uh, consumers, often in neighborhoods, uh, where you have um, a smaller delivery radius um, and where you have typically larger or more frequency of of um, um, of um, fulfillment centers, as opposed to the traditional way of doing fulfillment, where you would find a large fulfillment center, typically in the hundreds of thousands of square feet, um, or tens of thousands of square meters uh, that are uh, located outside of uh, urban centers. Uh, so what you can see here is, is I guess, an illustration of uh, the before and after look. And what you can see clearly is that. There are kind of two steps here, and uh, um, in, in the case of uh, local fulfillment, there's the fulfillment to the actual stores and warehouses, and then there's the actual final node. Now, what you'll see here, uh, a couple of advantages uh, and um, uh, of this is that uh, when you talk about the last mile, which is really from the local fulfillment center, either a store or warehouse, you can actually go towards smaller um, vehicles. Uh, you can, and because this, the, the fulfillment centers are located closer to the consumers, there's also a possibility in some cases, some urban areas for the consumer to actually go and pick up items themselves. Um, we didn't, uh, we looked at electrification, but we didn't look only at electrification. We looked at a combination of multiple things to uh, see what, the, what would be the result of this research on gener uh, generically um, the last mile from a, um, I guess, energy consumption perspective, uh, carbon emission, and just general economics as well. Uh, so, uh, what we found was uh, from this research uh, is that um, uh, the uh, fulfillment centers uh, resulted in a decrease of 17 to 26 percent in terms of um, uh, carbon emissions uh, between 2020 and 2025. And this was uh, broadly consistent across the, the three cities. In addition to that, uh, from a delivery traffic, we saw a considerable uh, decline. 
Uh, and this is, remember, this is, you know, assuming ongoing uh, growth of e-commerce. Uh, we saw a decline or decrease of 13% uh, in Chicago and London of delivery traffic and a 2% decline uh, in Sydney. You might be wondering what the, what the reason is behind Sydney. Uh, two reasons. Uh, uh, one is uh, just the um, uh, level of con current congestion in Sydney. And secondly, uh, the um, um, degree of maturity of e-commerce. It's a little bit more mature in Chicago and London than it is in Sydney. So uh, that, that's what our research uh, showed. Now, if I continue here, um, we uh, see some of the impacts of local fulfillment. We, we looked at a number of things. We, so we didn't focus on just electrification or, or distance, but we looked at a number of different factors. Um, um, one of them uh, being that uh, we uh, um, uh, looked at uh, local uh, or route optimization in addition to local fulfillment to see how much that would um, uh, improve um, just the, uh, the numbers. And that added uh, roughly about a 79% gain in, in efficiency and also reduction in uh, delivery of high emissions. Uh, we looked at also um, uh, the consumers actually going getting their parcels. We looked at smaller vehicles, therefore smaller consumption. We looked at uh, also uh, the use of analytics to be able to uh, better increase route density and drop density so that uh, when you actually go out for delivery, you uh, are uh, more efficient as well. So all of this uh, led to the savings that we um, have uh, we showed so far. Uh, we also have some additional uh, um, impacts here uh, in terms of uh, uh, reduction of passenger vehicles. Uh, so less people going actually picking up their items themselves uh, and actually relying on more of a call it a milk run, right? Uh, multiple pickups and multiple delivery type model, which also helped to reduce um, the, um, uh, the carbon footprint. Um, so the question is, how can we make this happen and more sustainable, meaning that uh, how can we make this um, durable and, and, um, and actually um, even more successful? Uh, well, it turns out that there is no one single um, stakeholder that can actually make this happen. It's actually, what you need is a, a number of stakeholders acting in harmony to be able to make a significant impact when it comes to reducing carbon footprint. Having said that, there are three things that we think are necessary um, to help drive a faster, cheaper, greener last mile. Uh, number one is to incentivize greener choices. The second one is to rethink asset utilization. And the third one is to harness uh, data and analytics. Um, and um, I'll just go into each one of these briefly. So when we talk about incentivizing greener choices, a bit like when you see calories on a menu, it does influence your behavior. Consumers do select, uh, when uh, offered the choice, a more uh, ecological and, and environmentally friendly uh, um, um, delivery. Uh, in fact, about 47%, 48% of consumers um, said they would select a greener choice uh, on last mile delivery and then would select that retailer over any other. Uh, in, ter in terms of additional uh, incentivizations, uh, governments and city planners uh, could look at how to incentivize uh, um, more efficient delivery and also reduce um, um, uh, deliveries uh, of um, multiple vehicles uh, on the same street. So there are ways to um, uh, incentivize uh, a more efficient last mile and only having one single vehicle going into one particular neighborhood. Um, when it comes to uh, rethinking asset utilization, uh, you might think, well, you can reuse uh, retailers' stores as uh, fulfillment centers. Maybe perhaps not the most efficient, but certainly it is feasible. But uh, uh, rethinking also the uh, use of shopping malls as uh, collection points, uh, delivery companies also cooperating to share some of the uh, shared uh, infrastructure. So, for instance, um, uh, fulfillment centers within uh, cities and also uh, some of the um, uh, electric, um, how do you say, the charging stations that. Uh, uh, you need for uh, deliveries inside uh, some of the cities. And then finally, when it comes to data and analytics, uh, this is about uh, uh, using information to help um, optimize your last mile. So this is, uh, for example, knowing ahead of time uh, through better planning and uh, forecasting the amount of uh, uh, items that will be delivered so you can uh, right size the, uh, uh, the resources and uh, the workforce uh, proportional to the amount of deliveries. 
It also means knowing exactly how many parcels on which street, so you can actually uh, optimize um, your um, uh, routes and your uh, drops uh, to, to optimize drop density. Um, and essentially using also uh, route optimization as another means of achieving uh, more efficient deliveries. So all of this leads to a uh, reduction in um, congestion, a reduction in uh, number of kilometers, a reduction in carbon footprint overall. And when you say that, it means less energy and therefore also less uh, expenses when it comes to uh, from a financial perspective. So that's kind of what we found from a, um, uh, a, um, a research perspective. A uh, few last words, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you need to work together and uh, the four biggest stakeholders that uh, are required to uh, work together uh, are retailers uh, to entice the consumers uh, to choose uh, greener uh, options, delivery companies, um, because they're the ones that are actually doing the delivery. Uh, so looking at ways to uh, optimize their fleet, uh, investment in, in data, investment also in uh, the fleet. Uh, governments uh, to incentivize and promote uh, greener transportation initiatives and consumers who ultimately are the ones that are choosing um, what option is um, uh, available. So with that in mind, uh, the, I just want to end with uh, just one or two comments. Uh, first of all, it is possible to offer a faster, greener, cheaper last mile, uh, but it can't be done alone. What we need is um, collaboration across all of the multiple stakeholders that uh, make up the last mile delivery. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. That was fascinating and uh, some really interesting research that I think demonstrates uh, the possibility of making things faster, cheaper and greener uh, in different ways, which you clearly outlined. I think if I had one question first to, to ask you really, which is, the point you finished on, which is this can't be done by any, and you mentioned it as you went through, can't be done by any single entity or stakeholder in actual fact to be effective. I mean, the, the faster, greener, cheaper is a, is a no brainer. Everybody wants it, but in order to make it happen, everybody needs all the stakeholders, all the key players need to participate together and cooperate together. Uh, otherwise, presumably it would be happening already, I guess, but what is going to make everybody cooperate? What is what is the, the trigger for that? Incentivizing individual participants, I can understand, but what is the driver for wider cooperation to make that collaboration possible? You know, that's a very good question. I would say perhaps uh, the the one thing are uh, I guess uh, shared incentives or or um, objectives. Um, already, we're seeing many of the delivery companies making investments and announcements. And I think taking last mile, or, or I should say more of the sustainability angle, a lot more seriously than before, not just uh, talk, but actually making uh, investments. And uh, and I think economics as well, inevitably, are going to uh, have an impact. And I would say, uh, above all, um, cities, particularly, I would say in Europe, where there is a greater need, um, could have uh, a major influence in um, um, shaping how local delivery uh, is done. So I, that, that's kind of my perspective where we stand right now. Um, I don't think there's an, a solution for this uh, or, uh, you know, a golden ticket uh, in any, by any means, uh, but greater collaboration and maybe incentives and someone taking the lead uh, might be uh, the first step. Thank you very much, Andre. And that's purpose in a way of this platform that we're putting together to try and integrate initiatives and get in, in, incentivize more collaboration, enable that to happen. But thank you for the moment. We'll, we may come back to your uh, topic in conversation and discussion at the end. But now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, who is Martin Schneider, who is head of operations in Zurich for SwiftPost. So Martin, over to you. Okay, hello. Yes, we see it. Go ahead. You can see the presentation. Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Martin Schneider, Head of Distribution Area Zurich at Swiss Post Logistics Services. In my presentation, I will explain how we are putting city logistics and e-mobility into practice in Switzerland's largest city, Zurich. 
what the current situation is and what kind of challenge we face in the future. I will keep the first part short. I think that all those involved in the field are already familiar with the current situation regarding city logistics and that is similar in all the city of Europe. Green mobility solutions are in particular high demand urban areas to the following reasons. Firstly, to anticipate regulatory restrictions. Secondly, in cities, competitions are increasingly entering the market with CO2 free solution over the last mile. And thirdly, sender and received customers expect CO2 neutral deliveries, but unfortunately are not prepared to pay more for them. This was also conferred by the federal vote at the 13th June when the CO2 law, which would have been financed by tax and duties, was rejected by 51 of the Swiss population. Expanding deliveries by electric vehicle will ultimately depend firstly on how quickly other parcel services provide make the switch and secondly of the final development of the Swiss post due to high initial expenses. At the end of the day, city logistics is a balancing act between the expansions of customers and of the society. I have summarized the conflicting goals on this slide. For the purpose of providing a more complete picture, here is an overview of the external influencing factor which increase pressure for sustainable logistics in Switzerland. You can read self quick. To develop strategy over the last mail, we ask ourselves whatever we could create or maintain efficient deliveries for the future with city logistics comprising major hubs as entry points to the city and several mixed letter and parcel micro hubs. Or in other words, Swiss Post needs to decide whether to give higher priority to the economics of delivery or to preserving the ability to deliver in cities. I'm convinced that establishing city hubs with electronic vehicles as a part of the strategy is a success factor for maintaining deliverability and access condition in cities substantially in the long term. Route will be reduced, alternative delivery option will be created for customers and if we provide available service, we will also generate corresponding customer experiences. Now in the second part of my presentation, I would now like to give specific example of how we are implementing city logistics, e-mobility and hubs in practice in the city of Zurich and what impact this has on our delivery processes. In the city of Zurich, we currently save 50 tons CO2 per year for parcel deliveries alone thanks to our city logistics hub model. 50,000 inhabitants already received 203 deliveries today. From a financial point of view, delivery by e-vehicle is not yet cost effective. It makes each parcel around 5 to 12 percent more expensive.
the electric vehicle, deliveries of letter and small goods are 100% CO2 neutral in the city of Zurich. We have been using the three-wheel keyboard stakes vehicle for letter deliveries successfully for a year. Due to increasing of small goods and small parcel, we have used an enhanced keyboard DXP cargo with the greater load volume since last year. At the end of the year, we will increase the load volume even further thanks to a larger trailer. You can see here the normal keyboard DXP for letters, the DXP cargo, and this is the new trailer. Uh, with volume. Some words about vehicle sharing. We measure uh, using and uh, to try improve to economic view. One moment. Uh. Okay, the vehicle sharing. What measure we are using to try to improve the economic ability to CO3 delivery? We share our keyboards DXP fleet with the companies Presto and No Time. Presto is responsible for early morning delivery of daily newspapers. Will No Time, a former traditional bike courier service, is an innovative company that operates in the eras of same day and packaging free delivery. An innovative route planning system is the cornerstone of their logistics. Thanks vehicle sharing, we can cover periods of use of up to 17 hours per day and substantially reduce vehicle costs. The new processes by combining our group units, post mail and post logistics into logistics service, as we are making use of synergy potential in city logistics and mixing staff, infrastructure and vehicle via our logistics hubs. In our process sequence, this allows us to save journey time over the last mile by combining deliveries to customer delivery points, receivers both letters and parcel. Here's a little film that show how this uh, channel transfer take place. We put the parcel into the letter routes and the letters in a parcel route. And so we can make the the routes bigger and that's more efficiency. In the next part, I will explain what measure we are using to increase the proposition of CO2 free deliveries. This slide shows the parcel product deliveries of letters and small goods are already 100% CO2 free. This image This image shows the current proposition of two or T3 deliveries in the relevant districts of the city. The figures vary between 5 and 40 percent. Why there are such huge differences? We seen in the inner city we increased the proportion to 40 percent by e equipping the city logistics hub with the electric delivery vehicle and forming mixed delivery teams for letters and parcel. 
Another way to influencing the proposition of CO2 free deliveries is to transfer delivery points in the sorting system from the parcel world to the letter world, as our vehicles for delivering letters are already CO2 neutral. This is being ensured by the ESOTS project Intelligent Sorting Delivery Points. In the west of the city, we have systematically adapted this approach and are now reaching single digit figures. In the east of the city, we have increased the parameters and are already achieved double digit figures. The disadvantage of increasing their sold value are increased reloading and additional transport, as the load volume is of course lower than for parcel delivery vehicle. At conclusion, this map will illustrate our vision of city logistics in Zurich. The Milligan Letter Center and the Urdorf and Zurich Ehrlichen parcel bases represent high performance major hubs at the entry points to the city. The expansion and development of the city logistics hub always used to guarantee local distribution over the last mile. All elements should be optimized financially and substantially in the future by sharing vehicle staff and surface areas. This is the current state of logistics in Zurich. The story will go on. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Martin. I think there was a, a, a very, very good view right into the, the, the how, it, how it's done, how it works, how, how one big city uh, is uh, or can be transformed through different measures or with different measures, whether it's the fleet, whether it's the, it's, it's the hubs. I have, I have one question to follow up. I mean, you were talking about the shared hubs, the shared hubs between letter and parcels. Yes, but I want I want to extend it since we were discussing right before about cooperation models. Have have you envisaged envisaged or have you thought about um, how uh, or if it makes sense to open the hubs also to competitors to other delivery companies? Is this also part of the strategy, or or are these going to stay Swiss Post models? No, I think that's the future because it's uh, very expensive in the city. And for the future, we also uh, open uh, these hubs uh, for competitor. Oh, we have fusion projects, Cargo Sutera, uh, and in, in, in this strategy, I think that also for, for all competitors in the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. We come back to some of these points during the discussion. I would now like to invite our third speaker to take the floor. Ellen, you are ready. Yes, I shall just uh, share my screen if you give me a second. Sure. Good, it's opening. Hey, how are we doing? Have you got that now? We don't see your first slide, but it, um, not yet, but we can see your screen. So we are halfway through. That's interesting. On the test, you should have it by now. No? No, just maybe if you just tried. Yes, now, now we can see the first slide. It's perfect. It's good. Good. It was just a bit of slow technology all the way from London, I think. So, uh, yeah, I've got a question up here. Thanks for uh, um, uh, letting me um, share some of our thoughts in London um, with this with this group. And it's basically, how do you create uh, the ultimate out of home network? Um, how do you create a green choice for parcel delivery and returns? And uh, the picture shows uh, what we see in London at the moment, um, a lot of uh, vehicles and a very large number of them uh, vans distributing uh, goods. 
So uh, I'll share with you some of our thoughts and some of our perspectives from a, a consumer uh, view as well. <clears throat> the context, of course, that we're all working on is that pressure is growing at, at all levels for uh, finding a better way to deliver the millions and millions or billions of, um, uh, of parcels uh, throughout the UK. So whether these are UN or global sustainable goals, uh, whether these are the UK government's uh, decarbonisation goals or, or strategic goals, or whether they're much more local, um, which is around London and the Mayor of London uh, has an operating arm called Transport for London and Transport for London have been tasked to uh, in a number of areas to make a significant change within London to reduce the overall traffic levels, um, specifically um, vehicle lorries and vans in the morning peak, um, to introduce more quiet tech, click and collect, and specifically to improve the efficiency of last mile delivery. So they, they have a task to do this, and that's why we got involved. They, they asked me to, to help them with this, and that's why we've been focusing on it. COVID, of course, has had a big impact, and now we have the London Recovery Programme, which is also looking to say, let's build back better, um, let's do things in a better way as we come out of this, and that's about um, the environmental impact of last mile delivery, its impact on communities at the end of the day, and uh, uh, how this actually translates into um, a, a revised version of High Street. So we've been working hard to to align ourselves to these things from the, the very outset. Um, the London specific problem, I think, can be encapsulated in this one graph, which basically shows, um, and it's, uh, if you extend it, um, you'll probably see that accelerate because the, uh, um, the problem with Transport for London was that they were controlling cars through their um, congestion charges, um, uh, ULES zones, etc., and heavy vehicles, but vans were growing at a very rapid and accelerating rate. Uh, and the view was that a lot, a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it was linked to, uh, to, to parcels. Uh, also that um, transport um, was responsible for 25% of overall emissions. So more parcels equal more congestion, equal more pollution in the eyes of the city. Um, and uh, the UK as a country and London as a city um, is, is acutely aware of the fact that this is a growth industry. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, London parcel deliveries were 500 million uh, items, and that's expected comfortably to be a billion by 2030. And we've seen about a 35% increase um, in London uh, over the COVID um, um, period of 15 months. So authorities are already taking action and they'll do more. And the question I think only is, do they do that by collaborating with the industry or do they legislate against the industry? And uh, that's, those were the sort of options, is it more congestion charge, ultra low emission zones, et cetera, restrictions on timings, uh, or is there a way that they can work with the industry to improve this? The bottom line is that parcel industry is the biggest single fleet operator in, in London. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, pre um, we worked with the industry to, to add these up and we found there were 20,000 vehicles in London delivering parcels. Um, 9,000 of these alone are Royal Mail vehicles based in London. Uh, and during COVID, we've seen quite an increase. So we believe that's already north of 26,000 in 15 months. So a big acceleration. A uh, vast majority of these are still in internal combustion engines, although all of the big companies are to some extent testing and looking to expand their electric fleets. Long way to go, however. And the biggest problem they got in London is that nearly all deliveries today go to um, the 3.5 million home addresses. Um, it was an 83% before COVID. It's probably comfortably over 90% today with more people sitting at home. And the alternatives to that are at best fragmented, lots of closed pickup shop networks. So if, if a customer orders five parcels, there's every chance they're going to be told to go to five different places to pick them up, which is hardly convenient for them. And therefore it's underutilized at the moment. And we've got a lot of people currently living in illegal um, uh, areas within London, and that needs to be rectified. And the authorities have a a responsibility, um, a legal responsibility to, to sort that out. Okay, so the problem statement was pretty well developed. 
The insight that we did uh, towards the end of last year, the work that we did in analysing this, a lot of in-depth um, uh, work, um, uh, BCG helped us with this. We did a big YouGov survey uh, as well. And uh, we found that there were some problems um, uh, from a consumer perspective, certainly at checkout, where only 3% of cu customers felt they were given a green option. They didn't actually recognise what the green options were. They knew they had options, but they didn't know the relative uh, impact um, uh, in terms of last mile delivery. Um, in supply chain, a bit of a mess. They're, they're dealing with complexity. The more they shop, the more of complex it gets. Um, they're having to deal with multiple deliveries from multiple companies, uh, and they're not really in control of that. No matter how good the delivery experience is, it still becomes inconvenient if there are many of them. And in last mile delivery and returns, again, there were problems there. I don't want to go to pick up parcels from five different shops that I may not want to go to at the best of times. Do I want to go, I don't know, to a post office just when everyone's picking up their um, their pensions? Uh, do I want to go to a, a corner shop when people are picking up, uh, school children are picking up their sweets at four o'clock or whatever? Um, so I want things to fit in with my lifestyle. I want it to be convenient um, uh, and and not something I have to do something exceptional to 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 follow up on. So quite a few problems uh, were seen from a consumer perspective, but that's opportunity. We also analysed what was happening elsewhere, and all of you will have examples of this. Um, uh, everybody looks at Poland. <laughs> Uh, where a lot seems to be happening. I think everybody's putting lockers into into, uh, into Poland at the moment. Uh, Amazon are increasing in that. Uh, certainly Amazon Hub has increased hugely in the UK and the number of lockers have gone up uh, probably about 30% in the last uh, 12, 18 months in the UK, even though it's still a relatively small scale coverage, but they're the biggest um, locker operator in the UK. In Europe, uh, out of home locations are reported to have grown 40% in 18 months. Denmark's building a large network. Just about everybody in Scandinavia is building a large network at the moment. Uh, and China, of course, has uh, installed about 80% uh, uh, of all of the global ones, whilst uh, the UK and the US are still largely underdeveloped in this area, despite being some of the more advanced e-commerce nations. So there is an opportunity there, but it needs to be an opportunity that's bought into by consumers. Um, and the research that we did last year, which I alluded to, had a number of study partners there. So TFL, obviously, as an anchor there, we had Hermes, the post office, uh, Metapack in Post Quadient, John Lewis, the retailer involved, and contributors, uh, some of the great and the good, contributing to that, uh, those thoughts uh, within the UK. Uh, and it came down to three things. One, we wanted to give consumers at point of purchase um, some clearer idea based on standards um, uh, as to what their delivery options were. So they knew what the relative um, uh, I, um, impact is of different um, pickup uh, locations versus home delivery and so on. Uh, we also needed to understand how we needed to enable linkages within the uh, ecosystem um, within the UK. Um, and we also needed to create a genuinely open um, parcel place network, um, which was high, highly convenient, hyper local and community based uh, overall. And we researched these and I sat in on many discussions with individual customers and we found that these ideas were very appealing and that there would be a strong possibility that customers, if these things were provided, would change their behaviour. But what also came out was that customers will change their behaviour. We'd like to think that everyone will do it for purely green or altruistic reasons, but that's just not the case. Um, it will require also us to deal with some of the more selfish um, um, uh, reasons for people to change their behaviour, and these might be cost-driven, convenience-driven, etc. So you can't assume that just because something's green, uh, people will, uh, will change. Maybe a third will, uh, but you need to um, and it was interesting to hear Andre talk about some of the incentives um, around uh, green options and so on. We believe also that there needs to be a differential and an incentive to do the right thing, uh, rather than just people relying on people to do it because it is green. All right, so strong con uh, consumer feedback. And we started to then say, well, what's the current state? So pre-COVID, we said 17% of deliveries in the UK are picked up either in, uh, in click and collect of one type or another, either in lockers 
but that's only uh, one percent in Pudos, only four percent, twelve percent in store, uh, but only seventeen percent, and that's been squeezed, especially the click and collect retail, because a lot of the shops have been uh, shut in uh, in recent months. And you'd have to believe ultimately that at least half of future deliveries, and this is in a growth environment, so this has got major capacity implications if you're talking about 6 billion parcels by 2030. Um, at what kind of capacity and what kind of scale do you need to actually have half of um, all deliveries um, picked up at some kind of con uh, consolidation point? Uh, and the other half, they were those that are delivered to home, been delivered by much greener methods. So cargo bikes, um, uh, the kibbutz idea that you saw, heard from Swiss Post, um, uh, electric vehicles, etc. And what sort of scale are you talking about? So at the moment we've got forty thousand pudos um, um, uh, and lockers in the UK, um, and uh, they don't do it uh, for UK customers. They're, 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 you, you can't go to any one place. So you need an open network, agnostic locations, and a lot more of them. So. Uh, circa 65,000 but open. So that's the kind of challenge that we're set to, out to do and that's what we're aiming to do starting with pilot which we'll be announcing pretty pretty um, uh, shortly uh, in London in three or four of the boroughs uh, within London um, to uh, show what a high density network does. We've, we're also working on green certificate with Energy Saving Trust as a partner um, uh, working on standards um uh, for the uk market uh, these could be applied beyond that of course uh and what would it take to create the ecosystem what joins up what's already there and what's missing uh, in the systems environment to join up the options um, um for customers and the informed decisions that they need to make at point of purchase with the high density infrastructure in all of the places, the right look choices that to fit in with people's lifestyles. So retail parks, local high streets, community spaces, transport uh, hubs uh, in London and residential areas. So that in London terms, this is essentially a walking solution that the vast majority of uh, customers um, will be, 90% will be within uh, uh, 250 to 500 metres of a location where they can pick up. Um, one type of location or another, uh, and that's the challenge, and that's what we're we're setting out to do as part of uh, delivering London with a lot of support from uh, London boroughs. Uh, Transport for London have been terrific in setting up the initiative in the first place, um, and uh, we're looking forward to the publishing, which is imminent. We're told of the UK Transport Decarbonisation Plan, which will set some demands on the last mile network, and ultimately. Uh, I think it's the point of collaboration that Andre brought up that it will take a number of people, a number of levels, carriers, retailers, um, um, to the authorities at the local level and national governments to help make this happen and to happen effectively across the UK. And that's our thinking at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. And I think you've explained very clearly the complexity of the situation in London. And it's a case study, if you like, of what Andre was talking about earlier on, a very specific one, but a big city with particular problems and particular issues in the UK with our general lack of use of out-of-home solutions and, and lockers, although that is changing and will change. And I'm interested to hear you say about the fact that you're talking about pilots in geographical districts to, to build the momentum and build a consensus, I guess, because it, it always seems to me that there's so many parties involved and so many issues, whether it's the carriers themselves and their logistics and their vehicles and their route planning and efficiency, if it's the consumers, uh, if it's the politicians, that somehow the, the breakthrough to make it more than just an incremental effort has to be somehow all coming together and building a momentum and i'm i'm guessing just i know a little bit more about what you've been describing but uh, uh, your main thrust is to build a momentum that will sort of start to accelerate as you do one or two successful pilots i guess is that the plan yeah it's, it's essentially it's, it's it's a proving uh, ground at this stage so 
bringing all the parties together and it's it's quite an important uh, ecosystem so you need carriers retailers um, etc all signing up to this local authorities bring it together create the capability make sure you've got these suppliers uh, in place for example lockers um, and so on and that is open in its nature from from the outset so getting that ready takes a lot of effort especially on the political side and um, to get that buy-in because uh, you need public space to be applied um, uh, uh, to this because this is about deep um, uh, community-based um, uh, solutions rather than retail-based or purely transport hub-based, which is be the way things have been um, up till now in the UK. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we line these things up, prove it, uh, and create a model um, which is replicable uh, at scale and at pace. Um, so that's uh, that's the, the the general idea. So uh, in London, that means that you're talking about quite a few thousand uh, potential locations uh, uh, overall. Um, and we're looking for our initial barras to sign up um, to um, uh, two hundreds each. Um, so and that's what they have done. Um, so uh, so that's great. We can go dense um, to to actually prove the point. And it has to be real. The big challenge then is behavioural change. Um, so this is this is environmentally driven, but the key to the whole thing is consumer uh, and consumer behaviour, um, and that's what we're focusing hard on because ultimately they need to decide uh, consumers that this is what they want to do for whatever reason, so convenience, cost, or altruistic reasons. Thank you. I think that I think you're absolutely right about the. Behavioural train change is often the hardest thing to crack when we're talking about big initiatives like this, and certainly uh, consumers' behaviour is critical to this to make it successful. I'll hand over to Bernard in case he's got a now follow up question. I haven't looked at the chat box. <laughs> no, no. In the in the chat box, there is no question. But I have I have a question still. I mean, you know, we we had now from a few speakers here uh, this notion of the. Of, 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 of these uh, delivery points, whether it's lockers, boot locations or whatever. Um, so I, I understand that in, in a very dense urban area, most people will probably not take the car to pick up their parcel there. Um, but if it's less dense, you know, Zurich, for example, is, is, is maybe then an example. You can say, OK, would people also then go by car picking up uh, their parcel? Or, I mean, do you have any information on that or how can you in incentivize people uh, and make sure that the way they pick up their parcel is an environmentally friendly one. So by bicycle, walking, is it a question of density of those points or what do you think? Our understanding from the people who are already picking up uh, from pickup points um, in London and the UK is that the majority of them walk uh, to those locations. And but those who don't, it's because of proximity. Uh, sometimes it's about alignment. So my wife very deliberately buys at a certain supermarket where she can order goods from their um, uh, John Lewis, actually, and she can go to Waitrose supermarket and pick up her John Lewis items. So she'll buy them on a Tuesday and pick them up on a Thursday with a shopping uh, or, or whatever. So some people choose to do it and to trip chain. Um, um, uh, at the end of the day, but other people, that won't be the case. So it's how do you fit in so they don't have to go out of their way um, and it fits in with their lifestyle, near to where they live, near to where they work, near to where they go, travel uh, at this stage. So density is key and proximity is key uh, to, uh, to the whole thing. Then maybe a, follow, a quick follow-up question, Derek, then I get back to you for another question. A quick follow-up question. I mean, there there are other options as well, which you have not mentioned, and I, I don't know whether they currently play. Currently, probably they don't play a big role, but they could. What's about in-home delivery or all these other alternatives where you say, okay, in uh, apartment buildings to have locker systems, or really the in-home delivery where you bring it inside the house or inside the apartment? Does this play any role in your uh, research? It, it does. I mean, effectively, as far as apartments are concerned, and in London, 50% of people live in an apartment. Uh, in my area, in uh, North London, 80% of people live in an apartment in Islington. Um, uh, and that's quite extreme. A lot of people near the city, um, young people um, with dynamic lifestyles. Um, uh, and we believe that you need a locker at or near uh, the foot of, of, of many of those apartment blocks. So whether it's inside the building or just outside it, 
um, it needs to be close um, uh, for them to fit in, but as well as at the tube stations, uh, etc. Um, so those things are pertinent and they are part of the planning by definition. Uh, some of the other home deliveries are a bit more niche. So home boxes, etc. We're not going to try and boil the ocean and solve all of the world's problems. We're going to focus on creating a high density, hyper local network. Um, uh, as somebody else will will have to crack that, and they may well have a place, and uh, and, and and I hope they do. If that helps people um, um, to fit in, one of the interesting things is there's a piece of research done by HMG, Her Majesty's Government, recently on. People, when, whether people were working from home or not, and it came out in the last two weeks. And actually, you find out that even though we think everybody's working at home, um, we're wrong. Uh, the vast majority of people, because they're postmen, nurses, this, that, the next thing, are not working at home just now, because you cannot take your patients home or your post home, or you shouldn't, certainly. Um, uh, it's middle managers and uh, executives that are sitting at home just now, or administrators. Uh, who are sitting at home and actually a lot of them were already sitting at home uh, uh, beforehand. So there is an increase at the moment, but it's not as big as you'd think. Um, so we we just need to think that we're not we're not standard. Um, um, we, we are not the people. And if I'm a busy nurse on a night shift, I may not want somebody knocking on my door to deliver a parcel um, uh, or whatever. Or I might want to pick up something from the pharmacy may not be able to the pharmacy might not be open on, on the way home to take something to my kids um so you need to have alternatives in place thank you and i think that illustrates alan how complex the issue is because there's so many different variables and so many different moving parts if you like and just to pick up what i come back to the premise of if you like our our initiative on on the sector and the sustainability is what can we do as a as a, set, a wider sector to drive this without having to wait for, if you like, everything to fall in line, the, the governments to make the right, the politic, politicians to make the right decisions, the local authorities, etc. There's lots of other people. We can we can we move the a, a step change on the dial ourselves without having to wait for all the others. I'll come to uh, I'll come to Andre first on that, and then Martin. Just a, um, a comment, though. I want to go back to. Can you can you hear me? Um, yeah. On um, um, parcel lockers and and just uh, the. Uh, I think there's an agreement that the um, uh, the greater the proximity uh, of of a pickup and drop off location or a pudo, the better uh, the likelier the chances of someone actually using it. But what we're seeing is our research tells us that most of um, of consumers, including your in Europe and China, where you have a high degree of parcel locker um, implementation. Prefer home delivery, um, and so if if you, uh, I guess what we're seeing, and many posts, uh, at least some of our clients, have uh, tried uh, parcel lockers, and, and it's been a horrible failure. I mean, they can't even get up to a ten percent utilization of these lockers. So, uh, and and I think it might be regional uh, where you see some success here. It's um, if you have the option of getting items delivered to your home um, uh, on first try, and that's kind of your primary, um, I guess, option. Um, it's going to be really hard for you to incentivize somebody to, uh, go for, uh, parcel locker delivery, because, uh, it's kind of the, it's a next best alternative. If you don't have the, the luxury of home delivery, and if you're in an apartment building and you don't have a safe place for storage in your apartment building, uh, then uh, parcel locker makes sense. And especially if it's on your way to or from work and it's convenient because people buy online. Uh, not to then go uh, out from and, and get off their, their sofa to go and pick up an item at the store. They buy online because they want to deliver it in the convenience of home delivery. So going back to, I guess, the uh, the whole discussion around behaviors, it's it's going to be a challenge to change that behavior, especially in those countries where um, people um, now expect home delivery or in those areas where uh, there's um, lower density where um, um, the other thing I would just mention is that uh, PUDOs and parcel lockers have their challenges as well. They're not flexible. I guess, you know, it's 
suppose you know, well, then there's no one solution um, to this. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but just I wanted to comment uh, more on uh, the parcel locker and, um, and and Pluto in discussion. Have we got time for a final comment from Martin? M Martin, about do you feel that Swiss Post is going to be able to drive behaviour? of customers by you putting out these electric vehicles i know you're doing that sharing vehicles which is already driving behavior of your your partners in a sense i think you're still on mute okay uh i haven't don't understand all I, my question simply was do you feel that the swiss post being more environmental going for these greener solutions in logistics is going to drive wider market behavior in terms of influencing people to be more green in their behavior and their activity. Oh, yeah. yes, I think so. It's, it's a generation, uh, the, the younger people, uh, they would these uh, services more than the older. I think that the uh, pollution problem and Zurich is not so big that the half million people and there are short uh, ways, uh, a good public transport, but I think that's the future. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think that we've got to hope that the influence of the younger generation or the more a sustainably conscious generation will drive behavior and will drive a sort of step change a more faster movement towards some of these better solutions the the, the solution ideas are there clearly we've heard about them the route planning the near local fulfillment the cooperation the, co the sharing of assets there are many different ways of doing it as well as the discussion about budos and lockers it's just the will isn't it and the and the Act incentive to do it, but uh, Bernard, perhaps the final word. Yeah, I, I, I think this was the perfect last question, Derry. I mean, the, the whole purpose of our initiative is really to show what the posts are doing, to combine those different uh, efforts and initiatives, compare them, drive them. And I think uh, one of those points why we created this is simply to make the postal logistics delivery sector a leader in change and to influence, to influence other industries, to influence consumers and to show them there are alternatives and everything can be done greener and more sustainable. And I think that's that's the important thing here. Um, I want to thank uh, all the three speakers that we had here. It was really very, very uh, interesting to hear all those different uh, cases and, and also research results and, and about your initiatives. Um, amazing stuff. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the participants here on the WebEx uh, platform, but mostly on the YouTube uh, live stream. And uh, I also want to announce briefly what we are going to do. So uh, the initiative is active and the next, uh, the next event is already up, um, which will be on the 7th of uh, September, where we're going to talk about net zero. And, uh, and this is just one step away from, from the big event, if you want, because the big event will be a physical life event. I hope it will be possible again <laughs> at Parcel and Post Expo in Vienna uh, in October, on 13th of October, to be precise, uh, in the morning. We have two sessions, um, which we are going to shape around the various topics of sustainability and, uh, and change that, uh, that is going to happen in the industry and hopefully also beyond. Uh, for today, that concludes the meeting. As I said in the beginning, um, the video will be on the YouTube channel. I'll distribute to all the participants and to all those who registered the link um, either today or by tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much again to everybody and have a great uh, remain of, remaining of the day. Bye. Thank you all.